Hello and welcome to the Today's Homeowner Weekly Podcast. We're here to help you with the challenges we all face as homeowners. I'm Danny Lifford. And I'm Joe Truini. And each week, Danny and I are here on the podcast to answer any and all home improvement questions. And we want to hear from you. Send us your questions or comments at todayshomeowner.com slash podcast. Okay, Danny, let's get started. Today's Homeowner Podcast is brought to you by The Home Depot, How Doers Get More Done. This week, we help a homeowner that's having a little trouble sneaking down to the kitchen for the midnight snack because her floors are squeaky, but she has carpet on it. Is there any way to repair a squeaky floor without removing the carpets? Well, we'll keep you intrigued there for a little bit, but yeah, it's possible. Why don't you just move the refrigerator upstairs? (laughs) And put a microwave right on top. A microwave. There you go. Move the husband downstairs. Who cares? Just keep the refrigerator upstairs. Boy, we solved that problem. (laughs) There you go. And um, I'm going to share a simple solution, how to recycle or upcycle an old milk jug into a watering can for your potted plants. There you go. Good time of the year for that. And on our DIY project of the week, have you ever thought about, you've got that pressure washer. Boy, you get a pressure washer, you realize you can use it for a lot of things. What about keeping your car or your truck nice and clean. Well, you can use it for that, but there's a few precautions that we'll share with you. And the podcast question of the week is how to insulate concrete block walls. I mean, once the wall's up, if it's not insulated, what do you do? We have a couple of ideas and we're going to run through them coming up. And all the things we're going through in our country right now, a lot of it focuses on clean, clean, clean. Some things work to really um, kind of prevent the virus from spreading. Uh, Some things don't. We'll try to tell you the right thing to do. So I've got plenty of things that we want to share with you. So let's get started. There's certainly been a lot of things that are happening throughout the country right now, and we don't we don't want to dwell on it. I mean, I know that you're probably um, overwhelmed right now a little bit with uh, some of the things that are taking place in the country and the uncertainty that we're all facing. Uh, one of the things that we know, uh, as Joe mentioned a minute ago, that you're probably spending more time at home right now than maybe you ever have before. You know, during the holidays, maybe we spend a lot of time at home, but probably right now you're uh, maybe getting a little uh, a stir stir crazy or or uh, uh, just kind of wondering. Cabin fever, they yeah, call cabin it fever. Here. I was yeah. trying to think of that um, and some of the things there. So we want to um, maybe give you a few ideas along the way of uh, some of the things you need to do. Joe, I guess, uh, uh, you know, when you are sitting around, especially people like you and I and most of our Today's Homeowner listeners, uh, you just don't want to sit there. I mean, you feel like no. you, you know, um, I, I remember times where maybe um, after a storm and you have that time where you can't really go anywhere or do anything right. or maybe... Um, You're waiting for the power to come back right, on. Right, you know, that kind yeah. of thing. You just, uh, you, the, one of the best, the, one of the worst things you can do is just sit there and listen to the news over and over and over. Um, I like to do something. I like to move in a, and, and you know, accomplish a few things and get my mind off of uh, some of the things that you just get battered with so much. Yeah, well, if you ever said, well, I just don't have time to get to that repair or to fix that, well, now you have plenty of time, right? So um, it's a great time to, you know, check that list that you'd started, you know, maybe refine it, add a few things, see what you can do around the house. You know, it might be hard to even get out to get supplies, but, you know, maybe even if you just reorganize all your tools or all the building supplies you've been piling up or check the paint cans and you know it's all those things that you just don't get time to do because you're too busy doing other things like leaving the house and going to work uh, which a lot of people aren't doing um it's a great time to spend time with family if family has moved home i know we have two adult children that are suddenly living with us again and boy they take up a lot of space when they <laughs> left they didn't take up so much space i need to i need to start building onto the house i think uh, the toys it's great are to have them now. home yeah. safe it's great to have them home <laughs> safe um but yeah i mean there's a great time to you know and if you have a if you were planning on a project coming up this spring or summer, building a deck or doing some exterior work, maybe now's a great time to do some research. You yeah, know? that's true. You know, work that's on true. that deck design, decide what kind of materials. You can research materials. It used to be, I'm putting wood on my deck and it's going to be pressure treated. That was your choice. But now, of course, there are dozens of choices. So yeah, I think there's a lot to do if you keep yourself busy and you're a little creative about it. That's right. That's right. And no doubt about it. And again, you still get that gratification that comes along with it. You also may be, um, may be running a, 
um, child care around your house right now. All of a sudden, uh, the, maybe a lot of the schools uh, are out, you know, in, in many parts of the country, and and uh, the kids are going to get bored quicker than you are. So that's for um, sure. You know, I'll tell you, I would encourage you to drop by today's homeowner.com and on our little search engine there, uh, put in um, projects you can do with your kids. You might be surprised how many different things we have one on there on how to build a simple little climbing wall. You can build it right in your backyard and uh, very safe for the kids to, you know, get a little physical activity there. Don't and, put it on a fence, though, because they might escape. Yeah, yeah, don't, don't let them, them escape. The That's right. Yeah, you want to put it in the middle of the yard where they can't uh, <laughs> they can't break and run for it, you know, and uh, to go get some ice cream. And uh, so, you know, you have um, a lot of things that you can do with the kids, certainly, um, you know, little painting projects and uh, different things that you can do. But we've got a lot of those ideas online, actually, in our recent um uh, today's homeowner newsletter, uh, we had a lot of those recommendations as well. And we'd encourage you to sign up for our newsletter. It's perfectly free. You'll get it every week in your inbox. All you have to do is go to todayshomeowner.com. Right on the front page, you'll have an opportunity to um, to sign up for us. And uh, we don't uh, we don't take your um, emails and spam around with a bunch of things. It's just strictly for that purpose, getting you that fresh current information each and every week. Now, of course, uh, a lot of people are spending their time cleaning, and there's a lot lot of misconceptions out there of really what will take care of um, killing some of the virus germs. Now, you know, you have a lot of commercial products out there, but Joe, it's just amazing to me all of the stories you're hearing about people going to the store and all right. of these things are gone. Of course, they're working hard to restock them and they're yep. changing things as much as they can. You hear the things about the greediness out there with people going in and getting hoarding products, just hoarding different products like that. I, I don't I don't get that. But if you're in a situation where you, you found yourself that you just really don't have you know, cleaning supplies that you feel like you need. Uh, we mention a lot of times about vinegar and water and splitting it 50-50, putting it in a spray uh, bottle and using it for cleaners. That works extremely well, but we just wanted to make sure that you understood that will not take care of the coronavirus germs. It's uh, it's great for cleaning a lot of things. It's really good. but um, And we also discourage you a lot of times to not use bleach. This is a situation that proper use of bleach might be your best way to go, certainly the least expensive way to go, but we're talking about um, when you have a, a, a gallon of water to put a third of a cup. So that's a third of a cup into a gallon of water to create the cleaning solution. Now, if you just wipe things down, that's really not enough. It's really advised um, by, by the officials and the CDC to apply this to the certain surfaces and then allow it to dry on its own. And so you really want to put a fair amount on these surfaces that you're concerned with. And, of course, bleach is bleach, whether you dilute it or not. So you have to be careful on what you put it on so that you're not causing any damage. But when you're talking about um, countertops, uh, doorknobs, other areas that you're really looking at sanitizing, um, that works really, really well. Again, a third of a cup of bleach and one gallon of water. And, uh, Joe, of course, a lot of people um, are recognizing uh, rubbing alcohol if if it's right. strong enough, it's also very effective. Yeah, you need at least 70%. And the al rubbing alcohol, I checked in our in our closet in the bathroom, and it was like 98% or something like that. So, um, yeah, rubbing alcohol is great. You can use it straight. You don't have to dilute it and wipe down surfaces. And it actually works better than bleach in, in some cases. And if you're concerned about the smell, it dissipates dissipates really quickly. So you don't have to be worried about that. And it's, well, I was going to say it's really affordable, but I haven't bought it recently. So who knows how much it is these days? Um, I don't know if there's a short supply of rubbing alcohol. It probably is different from state to state. But yeah, definitely get some rubbing alcohol. You can just dab it onto a cotton pad for small surfaces or put it in a spray bottle. We always talk about one quart spray bottle. You can buy them very affordably for one to two dollars each and label it really clearly because you know most of these are clear and who knows what's in them once you pour it in so write the little recipe on it if you're mixing two different things in that bottle but write it right on right on the outside um, but yeah rubbing alcohol is a ordinarily if it's still affordable a great way to kill germs on all surfaces and you know one of the things here we're hearing a lot about and I, I just shake my head when i think about this people lining up at the liquor stores to buy vodka to clean their house. Well, that is a myth. Vodka or other distilled spirits are not strong enough 
to kill the germs you need to be killing. So, but who cares if you drink half of the bottle I know. and use well, the that, other half for rubbing? That's the thing. Then you, you yeah. turn on your little karaoke app and you just forget about what's <laughs> happening in the world. That, but that sounds that sounds like a myth started by the by the vodka manufacturers. I think so it? too. So, I mean, it it does clean things, but not the uh, the the level of cleaning that you need. And of course, you know, we always recommend you know the use of of, of rubber gloves and you know just going to the full extreme right now. And and maybe it does seem a little paranoid, uh, you know, paranoia or a little bit extreme, but it's not right now. That's what we, we all need to get in line. We all need to do our part. We're all in this together to really yep. try to figure out how we can emerge from this very, very unusual time uh, in our in our careers, in our life, in our country. And uh, we really, uh, I'm, I'm certainly an optimist and I certainly feel like this will be something that'll be in our rearview mirror uh, before long. Is that two then, weeks? Is that two months? It's hard to say. Right. And we don't you've heard this from everybody and it's worth repeating. The most important thing you can do is just wash your hands. That's and all right. you need is soap and water. You don't need anything special. Soap and water for at least 20 seconds, which is like singing the happy birthday song twice. So that's what you have to do <laughs> and do it as often as possible. That's right. Exactly. It's time for our best new product segment brought to you by the Home Depot. How doers get more done. Drywall repairs don't usually involve a lot of hard work. They just seem to take forever because of the drying time required by most um, joint compounds. But DAP's new fast-drying spackling paste aims to change all of that. It allows you to finish eight times faster than traditional heavyweight spackling compounds. This formula allows you to paint over repair in as little as 15 minutes after you apply it. Now, I've done a lot of drywall repairs, and believe me, that is really, really fast. Plus, it provides the same strength and durability of a traditional heavyweight spackling. And it comes ready to use straight out of the bucket with a smooth spread that won't shrink, crack, or sink, sink into it. That, that generally means you have to put a second coat on. Of course, if it's a fairly deep crack, you might have to put a second coat, but with this drying time, that won't hold you up at all. So for more information on DAP's fast drying spackling paste, log on to Home Depot. Dot com. So that's a that's one of those things, Joe. It's it's you know we've talked about it before on some different methods, building material methods, and you right. take joint compound and you apply it, and you know the old school guys go, okay, I'll see you tomorrow. Well, wait a minute. Yeah, right. Wait a minute. Come back here. We can we we can accelerate this. We have fast mud. We have this. We have that. Right. So when you have something like this with DAP, uh, that can that can make a that doorknob hole or that indentation yep. or that little repair you find that you need to do before you paint uh, makes it uh, almost a, a you know a no brainer. Right. And if you're thinking, well, there've always been fast setting compounds. Yeah, there have been, but a lot of them. Fat they set so fast that there's always shrinkage, right? And yeah. if and some of them would crack because they shrink because they dry so quickly. But now that this formula that DAP has come up with, you know, eliminates both those problems where it would shrink and then crack. And it's like, well, now I still I still have a repair to make. That's right. Yeah. You know, so yeah. so that was the trick: how to get it to to dry, nice, flat, and smooth without shrinking. There you go. Let's go right back to the Today's Homeowner Hotline right now. Jim is on the line with a little discussion about spray foam. Jim, welcome to the show. Hi, Danny. What you got going on there in that attic? Well, uh, besides a lot of hot air, I'm... I'm uh... <laughs> That reminds I'm, me. Of, uh, that reminds me of my um, co-host Joe Truini. Yeah, a lot of hot air. <laughs> he keeps me in the attic because I'm full of hot air. There you go. Well, I'm I'm planning on doing some air sealing, and uh, then uh, you know, after removing all the old insulation, but with a can foam sealer, I'm wondering if I need to leave the house. You know, I have a, I have a cats, I have allergies, I'll, and, and I have a wife. Uh, and I don't want any of them to get sick. So um, I like the way the wife came in third after you and the cats. That was, that was <laughs> perfect, Jim. No, I hope yeah, she's not wife. listening. That's right. <laughs> she, yeah, she's not listening, hopefully. Okay. <laughs> well, so now you're you're saying um, can spray foam. Are you speaking of like the expandable foam and you're planning on going around and I assume sealing up around recessed lights and um, other penetrations and you know exhaust fans? Is that where you're headed with it? Exactly, except for I'm hiring somebody. I, I, I can't do that myself. Sure, yeah. sure. <laughs> uh, but you're also, um, then, are you you're putting the spray foam um, under the underside of the decking of the roof as well to encapsulate the attic? Uh, no, we're not going to go that far. We're doing the uh, 
just regular insulation, but uh, just just the uh, spray foam to, to seal off all okay. the uh, top plates and such. Okay, I got you. Well, you know, um, there is there is a, a level of outgassing on that, but you're talking about a small quantity here, a relatively small quantity versus a full encapsulation of um, of a attic a attic space. When you said you were removing all of the insulation, that that gave me the impression that maybe you were doing uh, the foam insulation under the roof. So um, I'll, I'll tell you. Um, um, you're not going to have, um, since you're talking about a fairly low volume, if you're just sealing up cables and se- sealing up different penetrations in the wall, um, always a good idea to ventilate it a little bit and maybe put a fan there to encourage that air circulation. But um, Joe, I don't I don't really know if a, a, a full 24 hours would be necessary if it's just a few cans of foam here and there. What do you think? Yeah, I was thinking the same thing, Jim. The, the recommendation is that You should leave the area for at least 24 hours after the spray foam has been installed because you don't want to be breathing those chemicals. But that's when, as Danny alluded to, that's when you're spraying like an entire floor of an attic or the ceiling, you know, between the rafters. You're doing like all the walls in your house before the sheetrock goes up. But for spot repairs or spot sealing that you're doing, especially since it's going to be in the attic, I don't think it would be an issue at all. I don't think you have – I mean, I might not want to be there when they're actually spraying, but once they're done and that's cured enough – to the touch that it's hard, maybe it's not fully cured, and that might take a few hours. I, I think you can come back into the house. I don't think it would bother you, the cats, or eventually your wife. You know? I don't think that'd be an issue. Awesome. I, I appreciate your help on this. Yeah, sure. Well, good. Our pleasure. And, and, and good proactive uh, homeowner there to be able to try to seal that out. That will make a difference. And then when you put the insulation back in, it's that much better. So let us know if we can help you any other way. And best of luck on that. All right, thanks, guys. Have a good one. Okay, our yeah, pleasure. Uh, no problem at all. And uh, you should have mentioned we didn't ask him how much insulation he has on the floor in the attic because you know we talk about it all the time here, Danny. You know, you can see the top of the joist, the ceiling joist. If you're up in your attic, you don't have enough insulation. You know, in most places you need at least fourteen to sixteen inches, something like that. Um, and it doesn't matter whether you live in Maine or Miami. You know, you need that that much insulation in your attic. And you know, Joe, when we're talking about people having a lot of time on their hands right now, that's right. even yeah. though that's not the most glamorous project, man, if you're talking about saving money on your utility bills, that's the best time. That's the best money to spend and the best time to spend on your home is upgrading your attic insulation. Yeah, we talk about it all the time, right? If you're going to spend money to save energy, that's where you start putting insulation on the floor of your attic and it's a very f- it's do- diy friendly and it's hard to do it wrong just get some unfaced insulation meaning it doesn't have foil or paper on either surface and roll it out on top of the existing insulation in your attic going perpendicular you don't want to go parallel with it because of course you want to seal up some of those gaps but yeah just add the insulation and and you'll start saving money immediately yeah, right it's, I mean, yeah. from, as soon as you back yourself out of the attic, you're going to be saving money. And if you don't feel like doing the entire attic, no big deal. Just just get uh, some insulation, whatever will fit in your car trunk or in the back of your truck, whatever time that you have, the money that you have uh, available, and just do your master be- over your master bedroom, over your foyer, over your dining room, wherever. It's a step in the right direction of really driving those utility bills down, which uh, everybody can appreciate that good news when you get the utility bill and it's cheaper than you thought. Hey, we're certainly glad you're spending a little bit of time with us, and we hope we can allow you to escape a little bit from all of the things that are happening on the news and in our country right now. It's a very serious matter, and we don't want to sweep it under the rug because it's it's real, but we certainly want to try to give you a little escape. You're spending a lot of time at home right now, right? Well, there's a lot of things that you can do around your house, and you don't have to get too aggressive with it, but maybe a few of those things you've been putting off, and maybe some of the organizational things, maybe a little bit of painting here and there. Um, And Joe, just like you said, which I think is a great idea, is doing a little research and careful planning on any other project that you may have in mind. Yeah, these days, of course, if you have a smartphone or a computer, doing research is really easy. You don't have to leave the house. You know, if you're self-isolated, I think that's the term, right? Self-isolated. You're Uh staying home and avoiding crowds. It's a great way. And that can be pretty time-consuming. I'm awful surprised when I go to research a building product for a new project I'm working on, you know, it might take me an hour or two. And I love it. I mean, it's time well spent and uh-huh. you can really zero in 
on the exact product, and then from there, you can start zeroing on on who sells it to you for the best price. That's right. That's right. And, you know, um, having access to the Internet and having access to all that information is great, but it can be a little overwhelming. And, and really, and sometimes it just gets aggravating because you read this one and go, oh, okay. You read the right. next entry, and it contradicts it almost completely. And you go, okay, wait a minute. That's why I really like to get to the industry uh, those that have the right. industry spokespersons and the industry articles that are, you know, really interpreting everything as an industry whole. That's a little bit better than someone, well, this is my opinion, and you go off in this right. direction or that direction. So, Well, that's the one downside of the Internet, right? You find information, you have no idea whether it was written last week or 10 years ago. You know, so, uh, well, that's I'm why sure. here at Today's Homeowner, we try to give you a fresh, the freshest information we can get. That's right. And I'm sure um, our next caller, Debbie in New Mexico, has probably done a little research, and she's trying to get, get, get down to facts here. So, Debbie, welcome to the show, and tell us what's going on around your house there. Hello there. Um, we live in a split-level home, and we have <clears throat> squeaks and creaks in the floors upstairs, especially in the hallways and in our bedroom. I wondered if there's a way to stop the floors from squeaking without pulling up the carpet. Okay. Well, uh, maybe. You know, there, there's there's ways that you can certainly improve it. I would never say that you can eliminate them all. But you know what happens a lot of times, and uh, this is just strictly my opinion, but when a house is being built, uh, of course, in New Mexico, maybe it's not quite as uh, rainy as it is in some areas of the country. But, you know, when a house is being built, uh, it takes a little while. At some point, a rain's coming through, and it's going to soak all of the wood that's there. Well, that's going to swell up that wood and maybe even pull the nails out just a bit. Well, the nails are not going to go back down unless they're pushed back down or, you know, most of the time it's nails. You know, it's great when people use screws on floors like that. So that's where a lot of that um, a little slight separation between your subfloor and your ceiling joist uh, occurs. And you have oh, all you need is just a little space there for that squeak to occur. But um, uh, now when we've done a lot of renovations where um, carpet is being removed, particularly on the second floor. We use that as an opportunity to recommend to the homeowners to really screw that floor down really, really well. Uh, Glue some, it and screw it if you yeah, can. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. So really try to tie it down. But um, if you don't want to take the carpet up in that situation, uh, Joe, um, I, I, I love that the little product. We've used it before and it's worked very well for us. Kind of has a funny little name, doesn't it? Yeah, Debbie, Danny's referring to a product you may have heard of. It's called Squeak no more and it's the perfect and it, it's, a, it's a perfect name <laughs> and they spell squeak with like four or five e's um it's made by a company called oberry enterprises so you can look it up online it's o-b-e-r-r-y and it's a it's hard to describe it but it's a, it's a kit that has a uh, special screws and this fixture, this three-legged fixture, and what you do is you drive in the screw through the top of this fixture, so it presets it to a specific depth. Then you use this fixture to snap off the screw. So what happens is the screw snaps off flush or slightly below the plywood, right? And that and that screws down the plywood to the joist. Now, the trick is, well, how do I know where the joists are? Well, that, you know... There are several ways, you know, even just tapping with a hammer, trying to find the the less hollow spot in the floor. And the joists are typically spaced 16 inches apart. So once you find one joist, and if you're having difficulty doing that, I mean, I would recommend pulling up the carpet in one corner. Just take a peek under there. You should see a line of screws indicating where a joist is. Because th this kit really works only, and this true of almost any screw, if you can go through the plywood subfloor into a joist. If you're missing the joist, it's not going to pull that down, right? Um, and I also showed a simple solution doing this with just trim head screws, which are a lot more affordable than buying this whole kit. Trim head screws are, they look like drywall screws, but they have little tiny heads. And you, again, you just drive them through flush with the plywood or a little below the plywood. You just have to be careful it doesn't get tangled up in any of the fibers of the carpeting because of course you don't want to start unraveling that um so th that's what i would suggest check out that squeak no more product all right 
That's definitely worth a try. I knew you all would know something to try. So. Well, that's what it's designed for, and it should. Uh, it has worked very well for us in the past. So hopefully that'll help kind of quieten things down around the house there, Debbie. And thanks so much for being with us. Problem solution, that's what we do a lot because there's a lot of problems that you have. Some of them minor, some of them more major with the home. But when you break it down and look at different options and try a few things, uh, then you can get to the, the solution on a lot of those have to say a very special thanks to all the people that reached out to us this week. I mean, wow. I mean, uh, we got such great messaging on Facebook. We got a lot of people that engage with us on Instagram, Pinterest. Uh, had some great tweets come in um, on Twitter, at Danny Lipford, and uh, a lot of things that uh, when people send us letters, people send us emails. It is really a great Today's Homeowner community, and we appreciate each and every one of you that spend a little time with us. And, and one of the things that we hear a lot about is the simple solutions that Joe shares with us every week. Joe, I always look forward to each and every one of these, even though most of them I gave you, most of them yes. that I thought about when I was driving down the old dusty road. Um, but uh, anyway, uh, it's all yours at this point, so go well, ahead. Thank you. You're so yeah. you're so generous. You can't spend all your time singing when you're in a truck, so you're coming up with ideas for me. I That's appreciate right. that. That's right. Okay, here at Simple Solutions, we're often talking about how to upcycle as opposed to recycle um, plastic bottles and jugs. And here's one for an empty one-gallon plastic milk jug. You can make a watering can out of it. And here's how you do that. First, you just um, take a one-eighth inch, one inch diameter drill bit and drill three or four holes into the plastic cap. And what you're creating is a sprinkler top. Now you can very easily and neatly water potted plants without fear of overwatering because underwatering is almost as detrimental as overwatering. And um, so you just fill the bottle with water, screw on the cap after you've drilled the holes in it, and just give the bottle a, a little squeeze and the, it comes out. Re- you can control it really easily. I shot a simple solution to this, a video that you can see online at Today's Homeowner. And um, the other thing I found is that we had a couple of potted plants and hanging plants, Danny, that were a little out of reach. Uh But if you squeeze that bottle hard enough, you can get a nice stream of water. (laughs) It went at least three or four feet. So so there you go. I I wasn't planning on that part of the simple solution, but it worked out well. So there's a great way to upcycle a plastic water or milk jug into a watering can. Uh, What a lot of fun and very, very practical. And you can see uh, over 500 simple solutions, 60-second versions on video featuring my buddy Joe Truini by going to todayshomeowner.com slash simple solution. Now it's time for our DIY project of the week, how to clean your car using a pressure washer. If you own a pressure washer or used a pressure washer, you know you can clean a lot of things there, but you have to be careful, especially if you're trying to wash your car. So here's a few things to think about. First, start off by using the pressure washer to rinse the car with just plain water. While the car is nice and wet, put a detergent. You can get a house cleaning detergent. They might make one specifically for cars, I'm not sure, or painted surfaces, but use the right detergent in the reservoir, in the pressure washer, and then choose the correct nozzle. It's often the black nozzle, but check the check the owner's manual to see which one you use to spray detergent onto a surface. Now, after you get the detergent on there, let it hang in there and stay on there for about three to five minutes so that it starts breaking down all of the dirt and grime that you have on your car. And then scrub it off with a car brush. If you're not familiar with a car brush, you've got to get one. It's a long handle, has super soft bristles, so you're not going to damage anything, and scrub it off. If you just spray it, some of that dirt will remain. So you want to get it off the car with the brush. And after that, you can use the green pressure washer nozzle to rinse off the detergent working from the top to the bottom of the car. And of course, if you're one of those that love washing your car, you know to finish it off is to take a nice towel and towel it all off to get it nice and dry and shiny. So that's a way to make that keeping your car a little uh, keeping your car nice and clean a little easier by using a pressure washer. Hey, we're going to roll right into our podcast question of the week where Sandy D writes, my house is built with cinder blocks. It's very hot in the summer and very cold in the winter. Can I insulate my walls on the outside or should they be insulated on the inside? Joe, we've gotten that question before and I guess the question would be whatever would be the easiest because um, creating an envelope of insulation 
installation on your cinder block home is the way that you want to do it. And there's several ways to go. First of all, if you have finished walls on the inside, that's a challenge. If you have finished walls on the outside, such as siding or anything applied right. to it, that's a challenge. But let's assume one wall or the other is um, uh, does not have a finished surface. Let's say the outside, uh, right. boy, there's a lot of options there. And um, going around with a one-inch foam yep. and just gluing it right to the wall, and then putting some type of vinyl or fiber cement or anything on the outside, boy, that'll tighten up a home like that. Yes, and the other option, of course, is people might be familiar with EIFS system. EIFS stands for, it's E-I-F-S, which stands for Exterior Insulation Finishing System. Uh-huh. And uh, you have to hire a contractor to do, but that would that would seal it from the outside. But again, yeah, it depends on what's outside and what's inside. Either way, I think Sandy's talking about a lot of work. I imagine insulating, which you can do, the interior of your home. I mean, that means removing everything from the inside, all the trim, the electrical outlets have to be extended. You know, put up pressure-treated lumber and boards, thin boards, and then one buys, then put styrofoam in between, and then you could sheetrock. I mean, it's going to be a lot of work, unfortunately. It should have been insulated, either built with insulating concrete blocks or insulated prior to, you know, enclosing the house. Um, yeah, it's a bit of a challenge once the house is built. Yeah, it really seems like the outside is the best way to go. I mean, you're not using up space, even though you're only talking about an inch or two here and there. It can make right. the inside of a home a, a feel, um, you know, a lot smaller. Whereas the outside, um, maybe there's even more of an advantage there because certainly the curb appeal could be improved drastically. And, um, and it's also one of those things, as we often say, you don't have to do it all at one time. Do one That's side right. or two sides, something like that, as you have the time and money to do it. Or talk with a contractor that routinely does that type of work, and you might be able to tie it together for cheaper than you might think. So. And the good thing about doing it on the outside is you're keeping all the mess and debris and the noise That's outside. That's right. Exactly. Because you know, doing it inside, what do you do with all your furniture? I know it. Well, I move know all it. that out of the way. Got to live there somehow. Carpeting, yeah. So the um, more I think about it, I think attacking it from the outside might be the option, the best option here. Well, Sandy D., we certainly appreciate uh, that question. If you'd like to send us a question that could be answered here on the podcast, all you have to do is go to todayshomeowner.com slash podcast and submit your question. We certainly appreciate uh, the comments. We've gotten a lot of comments on the podcast. I have to read one here, even though I'm, maybe I'm bragging a little bit too much here. But uh, Christine writes, the most useful, realistic home improvement show period. Always wow. always relevant. None of that silly theatrical arguments and budget fiascos of other shows. This one is for real homeowners who want practical ideas. So very much appreciated. This show needs no alterations. Excellent. Wow. Thank you, Danny Lifford. Well, Christine, thank you for taking the time to write that. We really appreciate that. And that's what we try to do is to really keep it real. And we don't need theatrics. There, There's enough drama in home improvement, don't you that's think? Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I did notice that Christine didn't say that you didn't need alterations. She said that the show <laughs> didn't need alterations. I was so afraid you'd pick up on that. As far as she thinks, that, the so. show is just doing great. Well, I we really appreciate it because that's exactly what we try to do, right? We're not looking to be overly dramatic or make every problem sound like it's unsolvable unless we give you the information. We're all in this together, and we're trying to give you the most useful, practical, up-to-date information we can. We do it all the time on a radio show and every week here I have all the time on a TV show and every week here on the radio show. That's right. And we certainly want you to reach out to us anytime. And that's very easy. Again, today's homeowner.com slash podcast. And we certainly appreciate all the great reviews, five-star reviews that keep rolling in on our podcast. Thanks to each and every one of you that write those reviews and certainly to each one of you that listen to our podcast, our radio show, TV show, website, wherever you get your today's homeowner information. We appreciate it. That pretty much wraps up this podcast for this week. I'm Danny Lifford, along with my buddy, Joe Truini.